passage of scripture. It is the favorite of many folks. We'll talk about that today. And the message title today is Influence. It's not just about the wine. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable unto the Lord, our God, our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's so much going on. So much happened this past week. So much happened in the month of April. So much violence, so much violence, so much violence. I said that enough to myself until I realized that I was quoting scripture. The book of the prophet Habakkuk, chapter one, starting with verse two, we find Habakkuk's cry, how long Lord must I call? for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. The wicked him and the righteous so that justice is perverted. God responds and God answers, excuse me, God's answer further disturbs Habakkuk. So he cries out again until God answers with a challenge to Habakkuk and Habakkuk 2, starting with verse 2. It says, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them. But the righteous live by their faith. I'm seeking to do what God told Habakkuk to do this morning, seeking to write a vision this morning that might help stop the violence, but only if the righteous live by their faith. And I'll begin by letting you into my worldview this morning as a black woman in this society that has been violent towards black people and in turn, black people are violent in their own communities, that even babies are being shot and killed. Letting you into my world view just a moment this morning. Here recently, I'm not so sure if you noticed, like I've noticed, but black women are being elevated to high offices in every aspect of society. We hear the good news almost every day of black women rising. Of course, you know of the historic victory of Kamala Harris as the first black, first Asian, and the first woman vice president of these not quite yet United States of America. George and Stacey Abrams nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Chicago and Melody Hobson recently named the first black chairwoman of Starbucks. Kimberly Godwin just last week named the first black woman president of ABC News, making her the first black executive to run one of America's major broadcast network newsrooms. Black women are rising faster than ever. Every week it seems there's a first black woman doing something in America, God be praised. But on the other hand, every week, if not every day, there are multiple black people being killed throughout America. Black men, women, and children are being shot by police. And I don't like to put these side by side, but also being shot by each other. 
violence running rampant in our streets, innocent children being shot, and we take it all in, traumatized by it all. Every day, it seems, there are Black people being killed in America, and I can't be the only one with cognitive dissonance trying to balance celebration and grief at the same time. How do I celebrate Kamala while mourning George? How do I celebrate Melody while mourning Dante? How do I celebrate Kimberly Godwin when the national news on her station will continue to be the news of murder and trauma in black and brown communities? This has been my cognitive dis dissonance. How do I celebrate progress for some black women, black people, while at the same time worry and mourn the death of black people across this land? And as I pondered this, the Holy Spirit caused me to pause saying, have you considered that the victories of black women are part of God's plan to stop madness and save our communities? See, my faith says that God has not forgotten black people, so God must be up to something. You see, maybe Kamala Harris's victory isn't just about politics, and maybe Kimberly Gottwin's promotion isn't just about the news, and maybe Melody Hopps's promotion isn't just about coffee. And maybe today's very familiar passage of scripture, which Alice read for us so beautifully, maybe this lovely story about Jesus turning water into wine isn't just about the wine. Let's see what we can glean from this story and the vision that might be written to address the violence. In the second chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 1, we find these words. On the third day was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Right out the gate, the writer tells us it's a wedding, and he doesn't tell us about the bride or the groom, doesn't tell us about the dress or the cake. The writer chooses to tell us that Jesus' mother was there. It's a big deal in the story that she was there. Her presence was palpable and her presence was significant. And women, please know wherever we are, our presence is palpable, our presence is significant. In my view, it seems God is placing women, including women of color, where they've never been placed before. We used to be banned from some places and spaces and now we have access to those places and spaces. And what are we going to do with it? Let's see what Mary, the mother of Jesus, did with it. Verse 3 says, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. I hope you saw the beautiful artwork on the front of the bulletin. The mother of Jesus standing, talking to Jesus, saying they have no wine. Jesus' mother is there in position to see the problem. And the problem is they have no wine. And I just heard you, I heard somebody say, yep, yeah, that is a problem. Wine consumption has been out the roof during this pandemic, but that's a different sermon for a different day because it's not just about the wine. This mother, this woman is in position to see the problem. And the problem is they don't have what they need. And it seems to me that God has recently positioned some black women, I'm still in my context, to see some problems in our communities. God is not asleep. God is not confused. God has not forgotten. Quite the contrary, God is making boss moves, strategically placing women in position to see the problems that are plagued in our communities. And usually the problem is we don't have what we need. That's why we're everywhere women, and that's why we're being elevated and we're being positioned by God to see problems, problems in education and problems in healthcare, problems in government and problems with law enforcement, problems in boardrooms and hiring practices and firing practices. The Lord showed me that God is placing black women into some positions to see problems in the black communities, but not so quick. If you're not black, and you're not a woman, don't tune out too quickly because Mary is not only a woman of color, stay with me, she's a person of influence. Somebody type influence in the chat. And everyone 
can be a person of influence. So now that at quickly I'm speaking to everyone. Mary had influence, why? Because she was Jesus's mother. I'm reading a book titled The Three Mothers, how the mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X and James Baldwin shaped a nation. These women like the mother of Jesus had influence in the lives of their story is not just about women or women of color and not just about mothers, it's ultimately about influence. And I'll say it again, everyone can be a person of influence. And the person of influence in our scripture today saw a problem, they have no one. So I ask you, what problems have you seen in society? Some of us have seen some problems that we've never spoken of. What if God positioned you with your unique perspective to see the problems you've seen? It's never too late to do like the person of influence in the scripture. She made a problem statement. They have no, no one. She named what was lacking. And some of us know what is lacking in communities that are suffering. We know what is lacking in education. We know what is lacking in healthcare. We know what is lacking in the legal system. We are positioned to see some problems, some disparities in black and brown communities, disparities in poor communities, disparities in LGBTQI communities, disparity in marginalized communities. We know what's lacking. Okay, then the next step is to do like the person of influence in the scripture, and that is to make a problem statement. They have no, you fill in the blank. And not only did she make a problem statement, she made the statement to the problem solver. And she said nothing more. In other words, she didn't try to tell him how to fix the problem. She in essence expresses her faith that the person she is speaking to Jesus can do something about the problem. People of influence, we not only need to make problem statements, we need to make them to people who can do something about the problem. In this case, it's Jesus. Let me pause there and put a plug in for prayer. Not only can everyone be a person of influence, but everyone can pray. So if you do nothing else, when you see a community problem, they have no fill in the blank, you can pray. You can take it to the Lord who hears us when we pray. And just as God answered Habakkuk, God may answer you the same way, write the vision for the righteous live by their faith. In other words, get to work, person of faith and influence. And that takes me to this question. Why don't we speak up in many cases when we see the problem? Jesus' response, I think, answers this question. Jesus says, after the person of influence says they have no wine, Jesus says, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus said, what concern is that to you and to me? See, some of us have seen some problems in our nation, in the community next door, but because those problems don't concern us, we say nothing. Reminds me of a quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I quote, he says, for evil to succeed, all it needs is for good men to do nothing. Let me pause again and express gratitude for the jurors in the Derek Chauvin case. Good people who stood up this week so that evil did not succeed. And that might have been okay. Jesus' response might have been okay about wine at a wedding, but it's not okay in speaking about disparities in marginalized communities. For King also said, we are caught my favorite quote, in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. If you haven't figured it out by now, whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. And he says that in a book that seems to answer Jesus's other statement, 
My hour has not come. The name of the book is Why We Can't Wait. Jesus says, what concern is this to us? It's not my time yet. King says, it does concern us because what affects one directly affects all indirectly. Jesus says, it's not my time yet. King says, why we can't wait? And the person of influence in the text persists. Jesus says, woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not come, yet she, her servant, do whatever he tells you. This person of influence was not moved by his resistance. She did not argue or fight with him. She continued to move with the expectation that the problem would be solved. And she begins to disciple others to get the job done. Verse five says, his mother told the servants, do whatever Jesus tells you. And persons of influence of High Park Union Church, if we're going to do our part in this network of mutuality, if we're going to use our influence, and we all have influence, in addition to making problem statements about disparities to people in authority or do something and do something to do something about it saying something to people in high places they don't have what they need and shout out to mission and outreach for the letter writing campaigns we do that and we do that well and we should continue to do that and do it with an expectation that the problem be solved but we're also going to have to disciple others to do what Jesus says do. What does Jesus say do? I'm glad you asked. In my Bible, in Luke 4.18, Jesus says that he came to proclaim good news to the poor. Proclaim freedom for prisoners. Recovery of sight to the blind and set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And not only that, but in Matthew 25, Jesus says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink and I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me wherever you do this for the least of these, Jesus said, you've done it unto me. And not only that, but Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these people of influence. We are not only positioned to see problems, but we are poised to make disciples. We are positioned and poised to help people do justice love mercy and walk humbly. We are positioned to register voters and to lead protests. We have the ability to gather people, educate them and compel them to act. We are positioned and poised with the ability to make miracles happen. For after the person of influence says, do what Jesus tells you to do, the text says, now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons, Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. This text keeps speaking to me. And they lift and they fill them up to the brim. And long story short, without Jesus touching it or saying a word, there was all of a sudden an abundance of wine for everyone and then some. There was more than enough. You see, many of us love to tell the story about Jesus turning water into wine because we love wine, but let us realize it's not just about the wine. The writer even tells us in verse 11 that this was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. All because this person of influence was in position to see a problem and to make the statement that they don't have what they need with an expectation that the problem be solved. This person of influence discipled others to do what Jesus tells us to do. And with the power of God through Jesus Christ, they got the job done and there was an abundance of wine for everyone. 
And while it's not just about the wine, it is about the wine because wine represents the flow of a life source. For that's what it represents when we take the bread and the wine, it's a source of abundant life. It's a source of everlasting life, which begins with life on earth. And there is plenty, the text says, in my spiritual imagination for everyone. That's how God's glory is revealed, that there is an abundance of life for everyone. So now let's go and do likewise. Let us be, as God said to Habakkuk, the righteous who live by our faith. Let us, as the song that the girls dance to says, stand up for love. Listen to clothes. There are times, and this is the, the song from the dance of, the, of Trinity and Liberty. There are times I find it hard to sleep at night. We are living through such troubled times and every child that reaches out for someone to hold for a moment, they become my own. And how can I pretend that I don't know what's going on when every second and every minute another soul is gone? Then Beyonce says, and I believe that in my life I will see an end to hopelessness to giving up and to suffering, if we all stand this one time, then no one will get left behind. Stand up for life. Stand up and hear me sing. Stand up for love. Thank you, Trinity and Liberty. Again, let us go and do likewise because it's not just about the one. God bless you today.